Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with The Secret History Living Inside of Your Aquarium. Today we're doing something a little bit different. We are going to talk about The Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium, which happens to be Celestial Pearl Danios today, once accidentally thought to be the smallest rasboras in the world, also known as Galaxy Rasboras, still today due to that error. And we're going to talk just a little bit about the country they come from, which is Myanmar, uh, also known as Burma, under uh, British colonial rule it was known as that. Uh, it is a troubled country that has had a very hard history and um, path, and until recently it was not open to the West in a very accessible way, um, and that is why we did not know of these cre creatures in the West, but now we do, and since 2007 uh, we have had these entering um, th via Thailand. Uh, these fish first entered the fish trade and then they made their way to Singapore that same month in August of 2006. And then by 2007, they made their way to the U.S. trade. And now we have them uh, firmly in our trade. It is reported that upon uh, when getting to uh, Harvard, some of the first uh, samples of this fish when they were deciding what they were going to name it officially and which class it came from, so on and so forth, uh, the, the fish actually reproduced within a week of being in country. So they're a great fish for beginners that are trying to breed a fish. They're beautiful fish and they're perfect for your aquascape. I'm going to go over their basic care and a little bit of trivial information about them as well. And then we will get right into uh, talking just just the surface of, of the issue of uh, Burma and Myanmar, uh, whatever you know the region as, uh, and why it is such a wealth of biodiversity, why we will be seeing a lot of animals in the aquatic pet trade um, coming from there and out of this opening to the Western world, and why it is at risk again, and why half a million people's lives, if not more, are at risk currently there. The Rohingya are a minority group there that are predominantly Muslim, but they are originally from uh, Myanmar to India and in between. It's not clear where they've been moving around due to conflict for a long duration of time. And uh, now they are a stateless group that happens to have been targeted by, uh, believe this uh, <laughs> or not, uh, ultra-nationalist Buddhist monks and uh, members, so uh, members of the government and of just different neighborhood groups and things uh, chased out of town for being Ill illegal um, immigrants, essentially. Uh, these troubles have gotten so bad uh, that I, I definitely urge you to take a look online at the plight of the Rohingyas. Make your own opinion about what you think about it, um, but it also risks uh, us being able to explore this region once again. Uh, also further complicating this region, um, because we're talking about the history in your tank, uh, is also they come from the Shan region uh, bordering Thailand, part of the Golden Triangle for heroin manufacturing, and warlords and hills tribes people um, that all form kind of stateless countries almost, uh, stateless areas and city-states um, control those regions and it is very hard to get in or out of there without alliances to them in many cases. So their name is um, Margaritatis, uh, Daniel Margaritatis, and that means heavenly fish adorned by pearls. Uh, in Latin, and they are a beautiful little fish. Uh, we'll get get one up here closely in just one moment. But uh, basically, they're easy to take care of. They're great for aquascape tanks like this, especially with monolithic monolithic features in the Iwagumi style tanks. If you've got uh, some nice fine leafed. Uh, areas for them to hide and lay eggs, they will do so readily. Uh, also, it's a good idea to have floating plants, or uh, right now it's all getting kicked around because I just changed the filter, so pardon that, but um, it's, it's a good idea so that the fry can hide up high like this or down low like this. 
So the fry come out very small and they are egg scatterers, the adults are, and that means that the males and females travel around together, uh, drop eggs uh, helter-skelter, and then uh, they fertilize, the, the male comes and fertilizes them. Uh, so that is how they reproduce. Uh, you can put them in a blank uh, empty tank with a mop or some plant java fern perhaps or something they like these uh more finely uh needled plants actually or like little crevices um, because they are found in the wild at elevation in the mountains in, in these stony creeks and things um you know they're all hiding behind this ledge they can be a little bit shy that is a ruby tetra right there right now they're all playing chase and they are the peaceful fish to keep but do keep in mind that uh, the males can be a little bit territorial, um, and you can t tell the males and females apart by the males will be much more um, colorful generally with their side fins, and uh, females have a white uh, belly or chest area, whereas the males oftentimes either have orange that extends there and kind of a blue-green color on the upper part of their body. Uh, I'm trying to get them on film. They're being so shy right now. I'm sorry. I'll put a good uh, thumbnail picture in there for you. But as you can see, they get along well with shrimp. They get along well with fry of a certain size. Um, this fry is safe, uh, being that the da the Danios, see, they all just keep popping up. So we'll just pick a spot and stick with it, okay? Um, but they uh, only get about two to three centimeters long at full length. And uh, that's about three-fourths of an inch to an inch. And they're great for small tanks. But you want to put them in at least a five-gallon tank because, like I said, the males can get a bit territorial over female mating rights. But if you have more than, like, two or three of them, or, well, let's say more than six of them. I have about, f I have five in the tank right now. If you get more than that, um, they actually, it kind of diffuses the tension. But, again, another way to tell the genders apart, um, it's a little hard because they're quick movers. They're really graceful and pretty fish. But in between their anal fin and their, um, their secondary uh, unpaired fin there, um, they have a spot very similar to this gravid spot on this endler here. So you'll see when she turns, she's got a dark spot right near the, her anal fin. Um, and with guppies and things like that, you can uh, tell the, the females apart that way. And that's where they give birth is through that area right there. Well, it's the same with... Uh, these are live bears. Guppies are live bears. They have live birth. But with the celestial pearl danios, uh, they lay eggs from in between that anal fin, uh, the two sets of them that run along the body uh, on the bottom. And they have a black dot on that uh, in between those fins. So uh, it's kind of hard to catch on film. That one did have the black dot if you caught it. Uh, you, you can kind of miss it in a blink of an eye. The males, that one there that was just lower is oranger, uh, tends to have a blue-green hue to it, whereas the females tend to have that kind of green, bronzy brown. Um, that's a male on the left right now and a female uh, right there. Um, and you can see that the orange is more pronounced. That's a ruby tetra. Um, so... That is kind of the critical stuff. They like water that is... Uh, 68 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit or um, in, as far as Celsius goes, uh, that's 20 to 26 Celsius. Uh, the TDS, they like very clear waters. They're from mountain streams and flooded pastures and grasslands, rice fields, uh, found in a very specific region in only two river valleys and their tributaries in Myanmar and a little bit of Thailand. And uh, that river, uh, it, it floods out very heavily in the monsoon season, and so they're used to only being in a foot or maybe two of water and so they're very comforted by shallow water that's slow moving but uh, clean because it, it is moving somewhat slowly you know draining at some point you know the other fish you know they won't come out for a single video and then they all want to ruin this one so 
uh, I guess that's how it goes. But they are just beautiful. The Celestial Pearl Danios are just beautiful. They really are amazing when you look at them up close. So look at the thumbnail picture, Google pictures of them. They come in many different varieties, actually. It's, it's very subtle, but some of them have stripes. Some of them have denser spots. Some of them uh, have uh, different colorations in the blue and green intensity level, red versus orange finish, and all of that. Um, it, it varies quite a bit. Um, but they are fun to watch, and when you step back from the tank, they are they will take up more of the tank, uh, whereas they're pretty shy when I'm right up here next to the tank with my hands around here and talking. But when you sit calmly, they definitely will come out, and uh, I just am not going to catch that for you today. So now I want to go into uh, last, uh, I just wanted to make sure I touched on the pH, which is 6.5 to 7.5. Uh, most of the sites which they were found at in the wild in 2007 are uh, 7.2 uh, pH. So you can add tannins to the water. They really like that. Um, they really enjoy... Um, having a, something soothing like almond leaves, catapa leaves in the water. They do well with snails. They do well with uh, neocaridina shrimp, as I said. Um, and they're a good choice. They, they only eat the very smallest of food. So uh, they will eat uh, plankton and they will eat algae. They will eat... Uh, small little bugs in the water and larvae. They love microworms, bloodworms, things like that. Even some bloodworms can be too big. So baby brine shrimp are great. Daphnia are great. Um, if you don't have live food, you can just crush up like uh, tropical fish food or uh, maybe baby fry food. They do have very small mouths, um, but they are an interesting social fish. One other odd thing is that the males sleep together at night in a group and the females kind of scatter which is just i don't know it's kind of odd to me I haven't haven't seen that at all the time um but as i said uh keep them in either a very small group or uh you know over a dozen of them 20 is great uh you can put 20 in a 20 gallon no problem with some other fish i've got four adult endlers uh a pleco six ruby tetras and five uh, Celestial Pearl Danios. I do need to have more Danios in here, but they will reproduce quick enough that that will take care of itself. You do need to make sure that they don't eat their young, so you can pull them out of the tank. You can put them in another tank or a quarantine tank because it only takes 80 hours for the eggs to hatch. And once those eggs have hatched, um, it, they are quick growers and they can, uh, within a, a couple weeks, they can be back with the adults and uh, hide amongst the, the foliage. Uh, I have planted this tank and this scape very purposefully so that they can uh, do that, so that the babies can hide up high and down low. And then also I let the Daphnia, and uh, you can probably see all this stuff in the water, but there's actually a lot of little um, plankton or um, zooplankton and uh, copepods and things like that in this water. Actually, the, the fish in the back right there was just eating some. And so that's part of what you're seeing in the water. Also, I put micro worms in, which had potato starch on it, and uh, that's what they're growing on is mashed potatoes. And that uh, clouded up the water also along with the filter. So uh, live food is always best. The babies definitely are small enough that they need some live uh Daphnia or something. So if you have a mature enough tank with algae and little corners and nooks for those kind of small um, protist uh, little um, critters to be living, like down in here they'll hide and stuff, or in between the rocks, uh, they may find enough of that without getting eaten by the adults. But uh, I would introduce more live food if possible and supplement that with some sort of flake food that has minerals in it and just crush it up into a dust. Uh, going back to Myanmar, uh, 13,000 years ago, there's traces of civilization there. It's a very old region, just like Angkor Wat in Cambodia, just like Thailand, if you think of the big Buddhist temples and things later on. Uh, since about 1000 BC, there have been cities there, large and small, um, in the jungles and on the rivers. There's been a thriving river trade culture there. It's believed that mostly Tibetan um, Aryan folks settled. Uh, and Aryan, I know a lot of people think of white 
people or neo-Nazis or something or, or Germans. Um, but Aryan uh, actually refers to the Aral Mountains, anybody f uh, east of them, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our ancestors and the English language Europeans and fair complexions are believed to have come thousands of years ago from that region um, in North North India to Central Asia, um, you know, Iran, Afghanistan area as well. Uh, but then they moved southeast down into Myanmar, as it is known today. Uh, by the 1860s, uh, Britain had taken over most of Southeast Asia, including Singapore, Thailand, or Siam, as it was known, uh, India, Pakistan, all, all sorts of places, you know, empire, colony, colonialism. Uh, they had taken it over. They had moved from a predominantly agricultural society to one that manufactured textiles and also cut down trees and planted crops and things like that. Uh, became a little bit more of a player in the world market other than um, being kind of a subsistence on local fish food and uh, trade goods. And then uh, after World War II, the Brits basically uh, were forced to abandon all of their colonies um, and turn them back to the people themselves to control. And then uh, Myanmar ended up becoming a, a representative democracy for a short time as a transitional phase. And then it turned very quickly into a, the old ancient tribal groups fighting over land and spaces. Um, the British, or modernized, as we may say, uh, cities, uh, Yangon and things, uh, the universities there were staging points for uh, protests. Uh, the military was strengthened by the Brits initially so that they could be a country and put down uh, civil war issues, but they had a civil war that is going arguably to this day with the Rohingya people. Um, so very troubled area, very interesting history wise. I will touch more on it in future videos. My heart goes out to those people there and, uh, you know, they've been through a lot. We thought that, uh, Myanmar was now open to explore and to get beautiful new fish like this and rasboras, a lot of the chili rasbora sized fish and, uh, rasboras in general and danios. Um, some of the, the barbs and some of the like licorice garamis and things, uh, there may be tons of new species up in the waters there. Um, it's a very water rich environment. Unfortunately, right after, um, right after it became a military dictatorship, it also became very violent. Many students were slaughtered, uh, by the military Buddhist monks for, um, you know, trying to, uh, either advocate their ethnic group or a religious uh, identity. They're both Muslim and um, and B Buddhist, and uh, as well as there are some Christian and there are also some uh, Hindu people in the country. And the factions of their various groups um, vie for control of things, even though the uh, Buddhist majority is is in control and in. As recently as 2006, it appeared that um, things were going to stabilize more. Um, there was a massacre in 2006, I believe it was, where several hundred monks were killed by the military that was protesting corruption by the government and nepotism. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this making it all near impossible to get into the interior of the country and try to explore the back regions, let alone get a permit to export out fish. You had better luck, and some expeditions did, uh, to talk to the heroin dealers and drug lords. Um, the city has, or the, the country has been, uh, routinely rated as the least developed in the world on the United Nations Index of World Development for roads and hospitals, uh, modern conveniences, and uh, infrastructure. But all of that being said, it is a very diverse place with a wealth of culture and animals alike. 
Um, I hope you learned a little something. I can get into the specifics on any one of these issues more in the future, but I just wanted to give you an overview in, in a little bit longer than normal video. Um, but thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for uh, paying attention. You're a true fish nerd. If you stuck out this long, please like, subscribe, take care of yourself and your fish, and tune in next time. And don't forget, swim on, guys. Good night.